So I think it's coming back to the understanding that we exist for the benefit of others. Now, we all know Rick Warren's quote that he put out there many, many years ago, where he did that interview with all these believers around, I think, this, this, uh, the U.S., yeah. and came back with this thing asking the church, why does the church exist? And 89% of the church said that the church exists for us and our family. So right there, if that be the truth, then the majority of churches will never be bases and don't even expect to be. And if those are statistics, while I'm not a statistics guy, I think, gee, that shows that what we're trying to do, what God's called us to, what the church should be doing, we're really going against the culture. Yeah, and that was true. many years back. So I don't know what's happening today, whether that has shifted. I think it has. Um, I mean, I'm, we aren't saying a whole lot of things here. Yeah? Yeah, but I do think if you look at the world today or the church today, I, th I don't believe um, that self-indulgence is the problem with the church today. I mm. feel like the church has shifted its focus back to the mandate and the mission globally. Now, mm. you can find me on that, but just from what I've seen from where we've gone, people are getting back to being serious about getting on with the kingdom of God, which is awesome. Good. So yeah. it's not self-indulgence. I think our biggest challenge is actually self-sufficiency. Mm. And what I mean by that is that too many churches or people or believers today are getting on with the mission and the mandate, but they are doing it without God. Right. And to be honest, they're both as bad as each other. To, to, to be focused on yourself is dangerous, but to be focused on the mission, apart from doing it with God, is, is the danger. And so I, I've got to come back to say, um, you know, we've got to start at the beginning of Scripture for anything we do, including based churches. And you, many have heard me chat about this and many others have. But if you go back to the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created, God spoke, God did it, God made it. And then in, in Genesis chapter, it says God made man. And God created man in his image and then in his likeness and he, he blessed. And if you look at the intention of God for people, and this is the understanding of partnership, that God made us with purpose. God, mm -hmm. um, he, he, he created man and woman equally in response, uh, in, in in, in who they are, we were both made in the image of God, man and woman. Right. Uh, we were made ultimately to have a relationship with God, which is the key to everything we do, being a base, being a believer. God is a God of relationship, and right. He made us. And I, I just want to say, I know it's obvious, but many churches have made mission or ministry or something the focus at the expense of the very reason we're created, and that's for relationship. Jesus came to restore right relationship back to God. It's about relationship with God. And that's why God made us. And He made us in His image, in His likeness. So, number one, we've been made with relation, for relationship with God. Mm. And that includes relationship with each other and everything else. Uh, the other thing God said is, um, is that we were made in His image. In other words, we are to reflect Him here. Mm. we image bearers. Uh, and I think that's key and strategic in everything we do, even being a base church. Yeah. Uh, the next thing we, were, we see in the, in the book of Genesis is that we were created with responsibility. And this is where partnership kicks in. That We weren't just created to hang around and enjoy things. We were created with responsibility. Uh, and responsibility to, to reproduce, actually. Uh, and, and so I, I just look at those things and say, okay, we've been given this incredible privilege. God created us to connect with Him, to walk with Him. Even when man messed it up, God put a rescue plan in place to restore it all back to how he intended. So he right. didn't change it. He just got us back to how he intended. And yeah. that's the thing we've got to keep focusing on. So I'm clearly believing that we, everyone, has been made in the image of God. But we've also been made with a responsibility here on earth. Yeah. And that's not do our thing and hope God's in it. That is functioning what God intended for us. So partnership with God is incredibly important. And I, I think a base will never be a base and we lose the heart and intentionality of being a base if we lose the biggest uh, partnership or the most important partnership and that's our partnership with God. Sure, absolutely. So we can talk and we will about partnership with NCMI and team and even individuals partnering together. But if you focus on those two at the expense of the main ingredients, yeah. you lose heart and intentionality because then we make it about these things rather than about our partnership with God. And so I, I've come back to this. If we lose our understanding and revelation and we're not pursuing partnership with God, we'll never be a base. We don't need to be a base. There's no reason for us to exist for beyond ourselves. Right. There's no reason to be a people who exist for the benefit of others if it's about me and the Lord. But if it's about His plan, hmm. His purposes, I think 
it always keeps us with the big picture. And the big picture will always motivate us to be a people who are open-handed, releasing, resourcing, and wanting to involve what we've been entrusted with to fulfill the mandate God's given. So again, partnership with God is so strategic. And it's the reason we were created. And so for me, I'm getting back to that. Even in our ranks, you've heard. Mm. I think, again, as, as I've processed and prayed, and not for strategy, and I just got your heart in this, I feel like God's reminded us, me, us in our ranks, in NCMI, and I think everyone should be reminded again, that, that actually we had to do what He's called us to. We're not here yeah. To, yeah. to ask God to be involved in what we're doing. And, uh, you know, the thing about partnership, the strategy, the key to any partnership is you've got to be all in. Uh, right. Partnership can't work. I love partnership. Uh, I think it's been God's intention as if we were created for partnership, but even I love all, co all partnership, and it's biblical and it's right. You can't function without it. But there's no, the reason I think most people don't enjoy partnership is because it's one-sided. But if we catch the understanding of partnership, I always use this illustration that we were given. Uh, feel free to interject any time yeah, and ask us, Chris. Good. But good. Uh, when Nicole and I got married, uh, before we got married, you know, I was in full-time ministry. I was an elder in a local church, and I was on this tricycle team. Right. And so this wonderful wife of mine to be, I thought, gee, it would be good for her to meet with some people who are kind of way beyond us in years in marriage, and they love each other, passionate about each other. This couple and. Even today, I'm madly in love with each other. I'm very old, and it's amazing to see. And I thought it'd be good for them to sit with Nicole, okay, and me, because I'm marrying her, but Nicole, and just explain to her what it's going to be like to be married to me, this man of God. Forgive my ignorance and absolute arrogance at the time, but that, that she, they should talk to her about what it's going to be like to And I just thought Nicole's going to line up and get behind me, and we're going to carry on hmm. with what it is. And we sat down at a meeting together, and they said, they looked at myself and her, and said, you both getting married because you're selfish. And basically, this marriage will never work. Mm. Now, obviously, that's not what I was <laughs> intending or expecting. Yeah. And uh, I was a bit taken by that. And he went, they went on to say, Tyron, you getting married for what you can get from Nicole. And Nicole, you getting married for what you can get from Tyron. And if that's your heart, to be honest, it's selfish and the marriage can never work. Mm. And, and it hit me. I thought, that is true. So he, they went on to say, look, the only way for any marriage partnership to ever work is not to go in for what i can get but to go in and say what can i give can i suggest be givers rather than takers yeah and uh, we've tried to do that 22 years of just trusting and not that it's been perfect but i've never forgotten that and, and i want to suggest if that's true in marriage that's true in every partnership yeah and i think even when it comes to partnering with god i mean we're all about what god can do for us but actually we can't do anything for God, but we're in partnership saying we want to bring what we've got to serve God's purpose and plan. God's all in. Yeah. He's never held back. He's doing everything, done everything to make this thing work. He's given us His presence, His power. He's given us His blueprint. He's I mean, there's, there's nothing God hasn't, He's not withholding from us. Right. But I think too many of us are, what can God give us rather than how can we bring what, who we are, what we're doing, and partner with Him. And so for partnership to work, we've got to be all in. It's not what can I get, what can I bring. And so I think just again, back to partnering with God. This is a God thing. This is not an our thing. So how dare we make it our thing and decide we like this and we're going to hold back and, and not be open-handed. We're going to use what we've been given for our thing. No, no, no. It's all belonging to Him. And we want to keep bringing it to that thing of partnership and saying, you know, Lord, we, we want to use what we've been given to advance your kingdom, to advance your your your. Uh, your purposes, we want to use it for your plans. That's partnership, using what we have. There's great text in Scripture, obviously, that shows where God's in control. And that thing of vision and provision, it's all in there. Right. That God's vision will always come before His provision. And uh, we've got to be living in His vision for the provision to keep coming. Right. Um, uh, you know, it's just right through Scripture. I think, for me, just looking at feeding of the 5,000 and all that, that's, that's us taking what we've got and trusting God to do what He can do. But together the job gets done. And I think too many are waiting for God to do it all. Or others, as I said earlier, are self-sufficient. We've got this God. Right. Our five loaves and two fish, we got it. God's like, no, no, it's not enough. But when you take what you've got and you bring it to me and use it for what I've given you, you'll always have enough. And in actual fact, the, uh, Mark chapter 6, the story of the feeding of the 5,000, interesting, was they had five loaves and two fish with what they started, which, to be honest, wasn't even enough for the disciples. Then after they used this for the kingdom and to feed everyone else, 
everyone else's needs, to, to, to take what we've got for the benefit of others. It says that 12 baskets were left over. They yeah. actually had more after they used it for the kingdom purpose than what they had before they started. So the point being is in partnership with God, we're going to keep on bringing it back to God. We're going to keep on making sure we're functioning. So local churches should have this heart. And we are in partnership with God. This church exists. We as individuals exist for the plans and purposes of God. And we're in partnership with Him. And we get that this is a sacred thing. It's not a good idea. It's not a man thing. It's not something we've downloaded from a book or a, or a podcast. God gave birth to this thing in the church. It's a lampstand. Yeah. It belongs to Him. It's sacred. It, it, and when we lose that divine element, I think we're in serious trouble of losing the heart and intention of ever being a base because it becomes about us. Hmm. And as we've been challenged by texts like Joshua, um, you know, Joshua chapter 5 has really hit me recently and I've been preaching it, so forgive me if you heard me, but it's good to hear in context of these truths. Yeah. Uh, you know, Joshua's standing there and about to take this most fortified city. He doesn't know what to do. Like most leaders, if we're honest, we, what are we supposed to do, Lord? And he was, he saw this man with a drawn sword. The Bible tells us in Joshua chapter 5 and and so he goes up to the man and he says, are you for us or for our enemies? Which is a good question, makes sense. Uh, and, the, and the response was, neither. Which blows my mind because surely they're responding to God. They've been promised this inheritance. They crossed over the Jordan and are now promised this land. So surely that person standing there should say, I'm on your side. But that person did it. That person said, neither. I'm not on your side. I think what it, that person was saying was I'm not here to take sides, I'm actually here to take over. In other words, I'm not on your side, you're on my side. Right. Oh, and are you on my side? And, and I was like, suddenly, gee, that, that changes everything. Yeah, um, and so for the question for us is, well, not is God with us, is God on our side, but actually are we still on His side? Hmm. And I mean, jo Joshua's <laughs> response was, well, what's the command? <laughs> he says, I've come down as the captain of the army of the Lord. In other words, it was Jesus that scholars will tell us and we know that because he was the commander of the army of the Lord and Joshua worshipped him. And no angels worship. They, we don't worship angels. Uh, we worship Jesus. And so he fell to the ground and worshipped him and said, what is the command you bring? He said, take off your shoes, your sandals, because you're standing on holy ground. And so I feel like it's like God wanting to remind Joshua and us. And right through scripture we see this, that God always brought people to him to realize first who the, he is and then what he's calling them to is a sacred thing. Hmm. It happens in Isaiah 6, in the other king as I died, I saw the Lord. The revelation, we all say the ascending chapter, but it was a revelation of who God is first. And then I'm, I'm going to go in this sacred moment and live out this, this mandate. It comes from the sacred um, heart. And I think the same again, just with, I mean, we can go on and on here, but even in the New Testament, the Great Commission, which we, I love to talk about, it's one of the key reasons we as a team exist i love to jump to verse 18 of matthew 28 but verse 16 says that they saw jesus his disciples and they worshiped him and some doubted and then jesus said all authority on earth has been given to me now go make disciples so the the great commission was came out of a worshiping seeing god and, and i feel right through scripture that's that's what we've got to understand that this is a sacred thing. The local church is sacred. The stuff we're involved in is sacred. Leaders who lo lead local church, this belongs to God. And our role is to get our hands off it and not make it our thing, but keep it a God thing. Uh, it gives us uh, just the, 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 the purpose and the reason for why we exist. Sure. And so again, in, in a long answer, I think the three key partnerships we've got to understand is our partnership with God, obviously our partnership with a translocal team, and you won't see the need for a local team, a translocal team, if you're not functioning in the bigness of what God called. Sure. Then it's just get a guy in to come fulfill, or come fill our pulpit. But if you understand the need to fulfill the mandate God's given us, the big picture, we're going to need these gifts to come help us. We can't do it alone. We don't want to do it alone, and we need each other. And that's understanding all that partnership, which, again, is a lot. Of, maybe another teaching, but but understanding the need for one another and the need for these gifts and the buy into the big picture. Of what we're doing globally taking responsibility of this mandate to get the gospel out so that big picture relationship uh, vision doing this partnership with god partnership with this team and we our team's ncmi so whatever team you're part of but obviously with us working with ncmi you'll see the need of that partnership as again coming into not not what can i get 
I mean, you get a whole lot when you partner with us, but it's bringing in what can we bring? Sure. What do we bring in? What can we help to get this job done? Not flying the flag or building a brand or naming our thing. It's just about the kingdom working. Paul talks about this gospel partnership in Philippians chapter 1. And he says, hey, thanks God for this partnership, this koinonia that we have in getting this gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's the partnership we have um, um, with NCMI and the team and working in local churches. And if you make that the focus without the big picture, that we lose that one. Sure. And then the last partnership, obviously, that we see in Scripture, well, there's many others, but the third partnership is individuals in partnership together in a local church. Sure. Most people, churches, make that partnership that yeah. exists as sure. a what. It'll never be a base. Never have a heart for functioning outside of who you are if that partnership's the most important. Other churches maybe buy into a big picture and they partner with NCMI. That's still not enough. Why do we need this? Got to come back to the big revelation, most important relationship, most important partnership. That we partner with Him. For that to work, we partner with each other. And for that to work, individuals all play a role in partnering together to be a base, to exist for the benefit of others, to reach out. And, re and God will make sure the church is taken care of. So again, we're a long answer. And I know there's other points, but to me, I think we can talk ingredients and points and even truths and principles that we've talked about for years. They make no sense or they become the focus at the expense of the main yeah. reason we have it all. True. And so I'm convinced the devil's strategy is to just lower the state or get us to focus on our thing or, as we keep saying, the devil's desire is to destroy us. But he's only really been given the power to distract us. And I think he yeah. destroys us by distracting yeah. us and functioning in our thing, making it about our thing and no longer serving the purposes of God. So... A very long answer to, uh, uh, and there's many more to, we can talk about if you want to keep asking stuff. But my, my honest, humble opinion, and again, as I've prayed and s s sought the Lord in this, in our ranks, I think if we keep those positions and understandings right in the right way, we'll never lose our heart or lose our intentionality. But if we begin to pursue all this other stuff, I'm not saying they're bad things, but they're going to add to this, not take away from this. Right. I don't think we'll see too many more play churches birthed into being bases, and I think we should. So as you go, plant, and whatever you're involved in, it's not one day when we have resources, not one day when we have people. Um, it's We're going to go with a hard intention from day one, and we're going to be a people who are open-handed and who will release and resource. 